Well, good morning, stewards. Those who've been with us for a while will know that uh, over a period of time, uh, we've looked at a number of names for Christians, and they all start with the letter S. And so far, we've looked at Christians as sons, Christians as saints, Christians as sheep, and Christians as stones. But today, obviously, we're going to be talking about Christians as stewards. Now, this word steward is not one that is used a lot today. It's not used all that much in the Bible either. But it is an important word. And it's an important word if, we have to have a, if we're going to have a proper understanding of what it really means to be a Christian, to live out the Christian life. But what we need to do first is to grasp the meaning of the word. And what we're going to do is just think about the meaning in the, in the normal sense first. For instance, where do we find stewards today? Um, apparently you find them on cruise ships. I've never been on a cruise ship, but so people who do say they've got stewards. I know they have them on planes, and apparently they have them on race courses, but I've never been to a race course either, but um, they have stewards at race courses. And today we had stewards. They came and took our offering. All right? So we do have stewards that we are familiar with. But what about the meaning of the word? Well, it's interesting to, to look at the, orig the origin of the word in English and then we'll look at it in the Greek. The English word steward is very interesting because it comes from the Anglo-Saxon, it's the origin. And the Anglo-Saxon word was stiweird, S-T-I-W-E-A-R-D. The first part, it's in two parts, the sty is actually a word for house. Now you will know what sort of house does a pig live in? A sty. All right, it's a pig's house. So sty in the Anglo-Saxon was house. All right, that's rather interesting, isn't it? The other half of the word weird means guard or take care. So a steward is someone who guards or takes care of a house or a household or the things in the house, whichever. Okay, so that's the origin of the English word, steward. But what about the Greek word? Now, I don't profess to be a Greek expert, but we've got some here that are, so I've got to be careful what I say, and I probably won't pronounce it right, but I don't think that matters too much. I get my information from books, and I trust they're accurate. Um, but the Greek word for steward is a word which is spelled O-I-K-O-N-O-M-A-S, which has two parts again. The first part, O-I-K-O-S, means house. And the last part, N-E-M-O, means to arrange. So a steward in the Greek is someone who arranges or manages a house or property. So a steward then is someone who's put in charge of property by his master. He's, if you like, a manager um, of what his master gives him to look after. So what we're going to do now is look at a couple of references in the Bible where the word steward is used, just to see it in its context. So the first one's in Luke 16. We're not going to look at all the references in ourselves this morning, but there's a couple we'll look at at the beginning here, and then I'll quote some others later on. Luke 16, 1 and 2. Luke 16, just the first two verses. And he also said to his disciples... There was a certain man who had a steward and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be a steward. So he got the sack. All right? That's bottom line. He wasn't doing the job properly as a manager. Another one's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 1 and 2 again. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. The 
Apostle Paul, obviously, writing to the Christians in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 4.1 Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. All right, so stewards are people who have been entrusted with something that doesn't belong to them, but belongs to their master, and they are responsible for how they use that. They are to be faithful and trustworthy uh, in their task. So we're going to look at this subject now of Christians as stewards under three headings, and the three R's here to help you remember. First, the responsibility of stewardship. The second, the range of stewardship. And then thirdly, the rewards of stewardship. So I'll just say that again, the responsibility first, then the range, and then the rewards of stewardship. So let's take the first one, the responsibility of stewardship. Now obviously, responsibility is basic when it comes to the star task of being a steward. It doesn't matter whether the responsibility is a small one or whether it's a large one. It is important, obviously, that a steward be found faithful, for unless he is faithful in small things, he will not be given responsibility in big things. In Luke 16.10, Jesus said, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So it is required of a steward that he be found faithful or trustworthy. In Luke 12.42, Jesus speaks about the faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household. Notice also that a steward is made responsible for his master's business. The goods he manages are not his own. They belong to his master. So therefore he is a steward of the things that belong to and come from his master. Now the first subheading under that I want to mention is we as Christians are responsible then for every gift that God has given us. All right? So we are stewards. God has given us gifts that we are responsible to, to use for his purpose. And so we're going to think about this for a little bit this morning. Very basic, very simple. Um, remembering, of course, that every steward is accountable to his master for how he uses what the master gives him to use or to look after. So I'm going to read a reference now from 1 Peter chapter 4. You don't look it up if you don't want to. I'll just read it. 10 and 11. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability that God supplies, that in all things... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Notice now that it says, each one has received a gift. In other words, every Christian has received a gift from God. All right? And we are therefore responsible for how we use those gifts. Now, when, we're using, when I'm using the term gift now, I'm not talking about gifts like tongues and miracles performing or anything like that. I'm talking about natural abilities that God has given us. We were born with, generally. All right? Because they are gifts from God. In his providence, he's made us the way we are. And we have to accept that. You know, and sometimes it takes us a while, particularly when we're young, to realise who we are, to discover the gifts that God has given us. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Now, the worldly attitude generally to gifts or abilities, natural abilities, is that they want to use them for their own good, all right? To make a big bank balance 
or whatever. So that's, that's the worldly idea. You use the, the things you're good at to make a lot of money. But the Christian's attitude must be different. We must use those things, as we just read, for the glory of God. I'm going to read a few more verses from that same reference in 1 Peter. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will colour, um, cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Always like that bit. Be hospitable without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So you see the idea? The gifts are given to us, but not for us. They are given to us to minister to other people. That's the concept there. So in verse 10 it says, As Each one has received a gift, gift, minister it to one another. So every Christian is a steward, and therefore we are responsible to minister it to one another. The gifts we receive from God are there for us to use for that reason. Therefore we are managers, if you like, of that which God has given to us for the benefit of others. The second subheading there now under the responsibility of stewardship is God's grace gifts. Right? God's gifts come to us by his grace in many, many forms. Verse 10, he goes on to say, as a good steward of the manifold grace of God. Manifold simply means diverse or varied, many different gifts. Now those guys who are knowledgeable about cars and motors and things will know what I'm talking about when I talk about a manifold. For the ladies' benefit who don't know what a manifold is, all right, cars have four or six cylinders generally, and each one has an exhaust port, and a manifold connects up each port and brings them into one pipe, which goes out the back. All right, so that is a manifold. It, it's the many things joined together into one. So God's idea is that all of our gifts, manifold gifts, should be joined together and used for one purpose. All right to minister to one another, but, another, but ultimately for his glory. Remember now that these gifts are gracious. They come from God, if you like. They are gifts from God uh, to us, and we must acknowledge that. We didn't do anything in ourselves to receive them. Generally, we had them before we knew we had them. All right? And so we are responsible to use them for his glory purpose. Now, our master has given every one of us specific special gifts for us to use. Now, I want us to think a little bit about some of these things. I'm going to rattle through a few and some of these you'll identify with yourself. All right. The first one is the gift of the gab. Now, you won't find that one in the Bible, all right? but some people do seem to have that ability to be able to talk really well. All right. Others stab and go on like I do sometimes. But anyway, it's amazing. You know, I'd never get over this, but as you know, one of our granddaughters is called Gabby. And, and <laughs> when her parents gave her that name, they had no idea that she was going to be a good talker. But she is, all right? She's got the gift of the gab. Right. So, so talking like that is, is a gift, and it can be used the right way. You can use the wrong way, of course, all right? So the gift of the gab, it's, we can use it, or people can use it for the glory of God, for the benefit of others. Another simple one is, is music. Once again, you won't see the gift of music mentioned in the Bible, but it is a gift. It's a natural gift that some people have. Some people have a little bit of music, a right, little bit of gift. They can just keep in tune, and that's about all. Others got a little bit more. They can sort of knock out a few tunes on a piano. Others have got even more, and they're really good at it. And there's a few that are absolutely exceptional. So these gifts vary, don't they? But they come from God to be used, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others, for the glory of God ultimately. What about the gift of, ad of administration or organisation? I never used to think that was a gift until only a little while ago, Cliff said to me one day, do you know you got the gift of administration and organisation? I said, me? I thought everybody could do that. And he said, no, 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 that's not true. Yeah. So it, it, you know, we've, we, God's given us these things. Sometimes they, they sort of come down in families, some of these things, don't they? 
but they're still gifts from God and he wants to use them for his purpose, not just for our own benefit. Hospitality. Some people are excellent at that sort of thing, aren't they? Other people not so good. So if God's given you that ability, well, he wants you to use it. That's why he's given it to you. Um, working with your hands. Some people are so good at work, they can do anything. Others are hopeless. I mean, Doug here, he's amazing. He's amazing. He can do anything. <laughs> he can turn his hands to anything. But why is he giving that gift to him and, and other people as well? Because he wants to use it for the benefit of others. I oh, know Doug does. All right? So these things are practical, everyday things. Um, gift of languages. Now, I'm not my good, I'm fat out coping with English. But some people, that, they can turn their, hand to, their mind to all sorts of languages. I call it the gift of tongues. It's the gift of languages, all right? The ability to be able to learn other languages and commun com communicate in other languages. God's given it for a purpose that we might use it. Gifts of helps. Some people say, oh, I'm the most good, I can only help. Well, think about it. We can't have a church or any organisation where there's a whole lot of chiefs and no Indians. All right? Just think of helpers as Indians. We need the helpers. It's like the bees. There's a lot of worker bees in a hive, isn't there? How would they get on without the worker bees? No, <laughs> you've got to have them, all right? So everybody can help. Everybody, I think, has got that gift. Gift of teaching, obviously that's another one which is obvious. Some people have that ability, others don't. If we have that ability, well, God requires that we use that uh, for his purpose. Other one, technical. Computers. Now, I, I struggle with that a little bit. I manage, but that's all. But other people like that over here, they're, they're, they're brilliant at it. They just seem to be natural at these things. Well, use it for his glory. Use it for the benefit of others. That's what it's for. Other people are great with children. Some of you know Gail Shallard that was. She's now married. But Gail was what I used to call a Pied Piper. No matter where she went, kids were around her. She just had it. It's incredible to see. Uh, and some people have that. Well, why did God give her that gift? Obviously, because he wanted her to use it for his purpose. Other people are good with money. I'm not. But some people are. And Andrew over here is very good with money and he's an accountant and, and we thank God for him. All right? So why has God given him that ability? To use it for God's glory. All right? For the benefit of others and he's doing that. Uh, there are lots of other things we could mention, but they're all practical things and it's all to do with being stewards. So God's grace gifts come in many different forms and everybody is different. The Apostle Paul understood this and when he wrote to the Corinthian church and he said to them, ask them a question, are all apostles? Are all prophets? He was waiting for the answer to come back, no, of course they're not. Because God only gave those gifts to specific men for a specific purpose. Right? So we must remember that God had a reason for giving gifts to people. And it actually goes on and says, God has appointed these in the church. They are appointed. God has given them appointment, if you like. This is your task. And we've got to think ourselves about that, that we have an appointment. God has appointed us. He's given us gifts and he wants us to use them as best we can for the benefit of others and for the glory of God. So we can see that being a steward is itself a gift from God and God has given us the gifts to enable us to be uh, stewards and we are responsible, obviously, to him for what we do. Paul said to Timothy once, Timothy, do not neglect the gift that is in you, that has been given to you. Do not neglect it, because it is possible to neglect our gifts, isn't it? Okay, so we talked about the responsibility of stewardship. Now, secondly, the second R, the range of stewardship. And I want to mention just three simple things here, things you may not have thought about in relation to gifts. And the first one is the gift of time. You might think, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, I'll show you where it is in the Bible. Ephesians 5, um, verse 15 and 16, and we'll have a look at it. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. 
Ephesians 5.15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Have you ever thought about the fact that time is a gift from God to be used for his service? You see, as Christians, we are responsible to our maker as to how we use the time that he has allotted to us. So he talks here about redeeming the time or buying the time up. It's like going to a marketplace, seeing uh, something that you really like, something that's going on a special and taking the opportunity and, and making the most of it. So we see the time God's given us. The idea is to make the most of the time that God has given it, given to us. Also, time is a very interesting commodity. I don't know if you've thought about this, but time is strange because time is one of those things that you can't store up to be used later, can you? You can't. It's impossible. All right? Time is there to be used then. And as we said before, time, uh, the Bible talks about time being, being oh, sorry, redeeming the time or buying up the time. But have you noticed that the world always talks about spending the time? All right? They spend the time. But as Christians, we must ask ourselves, am I a good steward of the time that God has allotted to me? Am I redeeming the time? Or am I just spending the time? Okay? Now, I'm sure we'd all agree that one of the most common excuses for not getting things done is, I haven't got time. <laughs> we all say it, don't we? But it's interesting, really, when you think about it, that everybody has exactly the same amount of time, don't we? There's 24 hours in every day and so on. So we've all got the same amount of time. It really just depends on how we use it. So this issue of being a steward of our time is a very practical one and we are responsible, obviously, to our God as to how we use the time that he has allotted to us. The second thing under this heading of the range of stewardship I want to just mention briefly is the stewardship of money. Now, Some people think, well, oh, money? That's not a gift from God. I worked for that. That's mine. All right? Is that right? Well, think about it a little bit. There's a wonderful story in the Old Testament in Chronicles about the preparation for the building of the temple in Jerusalem in King David's day. And uh, you ever thought where all the money came from to build it? It came from people. All right? 1 Corinthians 29. I'll just read a few verses. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honour come from you. And you reign over all. In your hand is power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now therefore, O God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I, who are my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. So God wants us to see that everything we have, even our money, actually comes from him and belongs to him. It has been given to us. We have the responsibility then to be stewards even of the money for the glory of God. Now, of course, we all know uh, that in the Old Testament, particularly the minimum amount of money that was to be given back to God was 10% or a tithe. But remember that widow that Jesus told us about who gave two mites into the offering box in the temple when others were coming past and they were putting large amounts in. And then Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, 
But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had, her whole livelihood. So it's not the amount, is it? Put it this way. It's not how much we put in, but how much is left. So as stewards, the question is, am I giving what is right or what is left? Okay? Am I giving what is right or what is left? Now this doesn't only include adults here, I believe. It includes children and young people, children who have, have their money that their parents give them from time to time, pocket money. I remember my parents encouraging me when I was young to see this as a gift from God and I should also use this to give to God as well because it's a gift that's been given to me. I'm responsible to be a steward of the money even that my parents have given me uh, to use. One more thing I'll just mention, uh, one more thing under this subject, and that is the stewardship now of the gospel. We've had the stewardship of money, now the stewardship of the gospel. You may have noticed when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, this is what he said, let a man, uh, sorry, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of Christ. The Apostle Paul saw himself and the other apostles as stewards, not now of money, but he's talking about stewards of the mysteries of Christ, that is, stewards of the gospel, responsible because God had given them, if you like, the truth of the gospel, and they were responsible to God now to dispense that for the benefit of others. And that's what was a burden for the Apostle Paul. So again, this is a great responsibility. Now, of course, we don't have apostles and prophets in that way today. Now, sure, pastors and teachers are the ones who are primarily responsible. However, every Christian is responsible to make the mysteries of God or the gospel known because all Christians are stewards of the gospel because we have been entrusted with the mysteries of Christ. And as we said, not every Christian is a pastor or a preacher, but every Christian is called to be a witness uh, and an ambassador for Christ. What a responsibility to be a steward of the mysteries of Christ. So thirdly and finally now, the third R this morning, the rewards of stewardship. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinthians in Corinth uh, says this, 2 Corinthians 5, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This can be a little bit frightening in some ways, but we all will have to appear before the Lord to give an account of what we have done with what he has given us. We are stewards. We are accountable to our master for what we do with what he's given us. This, of course, makes being a steward a very serious matter indeed. But then Paul adds one more statement which emphasises even more the seriousness of being a steward of Christ. He says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The Apostle Paul obviously had an understanding of who God was and who Christ was. And he understood that one day he would have to stand before him. He understood what it meant to have an understanding of the terror of the Lord or who God really was in his character. And he felt that that was a motivation for him to be a good steward, a faithful steward, because he knew that he would have to give an account to his master one day with what he did, with what the master had given him. But then in Matthew 25, we have the parable of the talents. The whole story revolves around the truth that this master had given his servant different numbers of talents or amounts of money, uh, and he made, him, made them responsible for what they would do with those amounts of money. It then goes on to explain that the judgment on judgment day uh, will be a time when these people would have to give an account for what the master had given them to use 
And that's why in verse 23 it says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So that's the other side, isn't it, of the judgment day. The rewards that will, re will follow those who have been faithful. So rewards handed to God's faithful servants as stewards and the last day will be for their faithfulness. The reward is enter in to the joy of the Lord. And so I want to ask you all some questions and ask myself these questions as well as we go down the list, just one by one. The first one I want you to ask yourself really, am I a Christian? Am I a steward of Christ? Am I neglecting in any way the gifts that God has given me? Am I a faithful steward? Am I using the gifts that God has given me for the benefit of others and for his glory? Am I using it for my master's business? What about time? What about money? Am I giving God what is right or just what's left? What about our stewardship of the gospel? What am I doing to make the gospel known? Am I taking seriously the fact that we will all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of our faithfulness as stewards? Does the fear and reverence of God motivate me to be one who wants to persuade men? I trust that the expectation of hearing those wonderful words on the last day will be what motivates us to be true servants of Christ. Those words will be, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. I trust that everyone here this morning will hear those wonderful words from the lips of our Master himself. Let's pray, shall we?